Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Barry Erickson and I am Community Engagement Coordinator at Wheaton Public Library. Throughout the year, we partner with the DuPage Art League to bring you these art demonstrations. Founded 63 years ago, the DuPage Art League is committed to the arts and bringing enriching programming to art lovers throughout our community. Located on Front Street in downtown Wheaton, the DuPage Art League is both a school and gallery. They are dedicated to promoting and encouraging the visual arts through classes, workshops, gallery exhibits, and free public fine arts programs. Their classes and workshops cover a wide range of mediums and are designed for all ages. The storefront gallery and gift shop are open to the public. We are grateful to the DuPage Art League for arranging tonight's demonstration. Brian Sauerland is a national award-winning painter that has focused mainly on pastel landscapes for over 20 years. He is a signature member of the Pastel Society of America and the current vice president of the Chicago Pastel Painters, an active group of over 100 members with all levels of experience. His work can be seen at Proud Fox Gallery in Geneva, Illinois, and J. Petter Galleries in Douglas, Michigan and hangs in private collections throughout the United States and Canada. Thank you so much for being with us here tonight, Brian. We are anxious to see your demonstration of how to create a winterscape using pastels. Thank you, Barry, I appreciate the introduction. Camera working on me so far? Yes. Great, okay. Uh, thank you very much to the DuPage Art League and the Wheaton Public Library again for inviting me to be here tonight. Um, I can't think of a more appropriate subject to be painting than snow on an evening where we're getting, who knows, four inches, 12 inches of snow. Um, but I thought, how appropriate, right? Even though when you guys asked me this six, eight months ago, I did not know we'd be in the middle of a snowstorm. Um, but uh, before I jump in here, I want to kind of talk a little bit about uh, the subject I'm going to paint tonight, this particular composition, why I was drawn to it. Uh, but I also talk a little bit about the brands of pastels that I utilize, the paper in which I apply the pastel, and a little bit about photo reference as I'm working uh, as well. And feel free to ask questions through the process. Barry will field some of those questions uh, during the demonstration, but we'll also have some time at the end to be able to talk about that as well. So uh, before I jump in here and start actually applying pastel, um, you know, I've had many people over the years ask me, why pastel? Why do you work in pastel? Why not watercolor or oil painting or, or something like that? Um, and I've been picked up pastels originally when I was in college and uh, I just love the immediacy of pastels. I love that uh, you can do a lot with the actual pigment. Um, it's very forgiving. You can brush it off, you can reapply it. Um, you can work, you know, again, very immediate. You, the cleanup is really nice and fast. Uh, also doesn't have an odor to it. So all of those factors kind of come into play. You can use it as a uh, pastel, as a drawing medium. You can use it as, as a painting medium. I consider it painting as most pastel artists that are professional do when you're covering the entire surface, it's considered a, a painting. Um, so those are a little bit about kind of my, why I'm drawn to pastel. And winterscapes uh, have always drawn to me. I love winter. I love the calmness in winter. I love being out in nature. Um, the thing I like about painting winter scenes is the fact that when you're out there in nature in the winter, your values are a lot more obvious when, than in the summertime. In the summertime, oftentimes you can be confused on what the value is based on there's like so much color going on. In, uh, in winter, it's more kind of black and white, right? Or, or various values of gray, uh, but it doesn't have to be that way. And that's the great thing about pastel. You can really jazz up your colors, um, but I find it just a, a peaceful time to be out in nature and to paint. And that's why I've always been drawn to, to uh, approaching the winter scenes. So as far as uh, pastels themselves, I use a variety of uh, sticks of pastel, a lot of different brands out there, a lot of really good brands out there. Um, some of my go-tos are Terry Ludwig pastels. I use Unison. Uh, I use the Jack Richardson now. I use a lot of the new pastels, which are a little bit harder to work with uh, in terms of the physical nature of it. Uh, but I oftentimes use the new pastels in the early parts of my drawing. Um, there's a lot of brands out there, Sennelier, Schmincke, um, several others. So I don't 
lean to one brand over the other. I just kind of go for the color. Um, and when I'm working, I work generally on a sanded paper. Um, in this case, I'm using UART. Uh, they have different grits of UART and uh, I'm using the 320 grit this evening. They also come in uh, 400, I think in 200, but I find like 320 and 400 to be the best for my style of working. Uh, obviously the lower the number, the heavier the grit and it rips off a little bit more of the pastel itself uh, as you're working. So something to be cognizant of with that. There are a lot of different uh, types of paper out there. Uh, sometimes I'll tone my own surface as well. I'll mix with a uh, specter color, uh, a fix and, and color the surface. <clears throat> it has a pumice mixed in it and gives you a little bit of a tooth. But for tonight's demonstration, I'm just gonna work on this uh, UART material. Um, I think that's about it in regards to materials. Now, as it relates to um, the photography, photography can be really tricky. Um, while it's easy to snap a picture and say, let's just go do a painting, you have to think about not just composition, but you have to think about the um, pros and cons to photography. Oftentimes when you're using photography, uh, you have, it has a tendency to uh, wash out the whites and sometimes the darks get filled in. So through observation in nature is really the only way that you really uh, understand how to capture color, how to see between the shadows, how to really have an image come to life. So while I use photography heavily in terms of my reference, um, I use my life observation to kind of fill in those gaps. And I use Photoshop sometimes to manipulate images. In this case, the uh, photograph I'm working from was a long, uh, narrow scene that had a, uh, a large tree that was actually further off to the right of the, of the image. I've actually moved it into the image a little bit more from a compositional standpoint to have a a larger element in the foreground to kind of draw your eye in. Regarding the image I'm using as well, I really liked kind of the um, soft nature of the foreground. It's not too complicated. There's a lot of little subtle shifts in color and value. And those are some of the elements I want to call out this evening. So um, I think that's about it right now before I kind of jump in. If anybody has any questions, obviously you can feel them to, uh, to Barry. Barry, has anything come through thus far? Uh, not quite yet, but Brian, should I go ahead and share your reference photo for for a few seconds so that people can see yeah. that? Sure, that would be great. Is that being shared right now? Yeah, okay, great. Um, yeah, and as I'm working through this, one of the things that kind of caught my eye was the way the light is hitting kind of on the left side um, of the image with these little grass reeds popping up. Uh, along this creek bed. And this is from an area not too far from my house at a, uh, a golf course up here in Palatine. And uh, what I liked about it was just the, the long horizontal comp composition of this and the way the back plane of snow was kind of breaking through some of these trees. Um, and I just loved kind of the long shadow, the way the light was hitting on that particular day. Uh, so I wanted to capture that and use that as the uh, inspiration for today's demonstration. Okay, great. I'll go ahead and stop that screen share. Sure. Okay, so now I'm gonna uh, kind of start jumping in here. I generally start with new pastels. I'm using a 223 is the uh, the number. And I'm just gonna start with the block in. So I wanna try to start thinking about my shapes, my larger shapes, the larger elements of this painting to compose it. I don't wanna get down into the detail and start drawing every tree branch immediately. Um, I'll get to that. but. Um, I just want to start working through the surface. Uh, and as I'm painting here, and again, I'm just using a kind of a light touch. I'm just kind of blocking in some color. I'm using my, uh, not only my photo reference, but I did a, a small um, six by eight study in pastel the other night, just to kind of help me work out through some of those, those elements and those compositional pieces or components. Great. All right, so again, just a uh, real loose touch. I'm just kind of blocking in some of the shapes here, but I, I'm going to try to anchor the, the painting as I work. And as I'm doing this, or the reason I'm doing this is kind of to provide a really solid uh, structure underneath. If you think about anything like you're building a house, you got to have good framework. If you don't have a good framework and structure underneath, then um, most likely your painting's going to fall apart in the end. So again, just real kind of light, and I'll uh, be adding a couple other 
um, pastel sticks of color as well, but I'm just kind of blocking it in right now. And I'm also going to apply some uh, denatured alcohol to wash it in. And that the reason I use that particular material is because that dries very rapidly and it locks the color into the surface. Now I'll, I'll show you that in a couple minutes when I get to that point. But again, right now I'm just moving through the, the surface here, the composition, kind of breaking up the shapes here into the larger, um, larger components. Get my uh, horizon line in here roughly. Again, I'm not really too concerned with the details. I'm just kind of just basically laying out the structure of, of my composition. I also noticed when I was uh, working through this, and I was laying um, some of the trees in there, there was a tree that actually fell kind of dead center in here. And I wanted to kind of move that to the side because I didn't want your eye to be confused or drawn to that, to that center section. And I had laid out a little bit of stuff, um, a few line drawing elements here before we started just to uh, give me a starting point to get a, from a time perspective, get me through this. Okay, thinking about the tree up here. Coming in now with a little bit of a, a darker pastel, kind of in the brown category here, more of an umber or warm earth tone. I'm also not pushing putting too much pressure on the surface, really light. And again, I'm just trying to establish the, uh, the framework here. And as I work through the foreground here, I'm noticing this just really beautiful shadow of a large tree that's off to the right here. So I wanna kind of block this in. And there's a lot of a lot of dancing between kind of light and shadow that's happening here, and that will I'll be playing that out a little bit further when I get into the painting with more detail. Also, it's kind of important to make sure you step back once in a while when you're working too, to ensure the elements kind of are in the right place, that you're seeing good balance in the composition. Uh, again, I'm still working in the black in a little bit here, but I'm laying um, some warmer tones in here because I know the sun is catching the tops of these edges of these trees. And oftentimes as I'm working through them, uh, sometimes I'm, I find myself just searching for a color. I'm not sure what it is yet, but when it feels right, I'll see it on the paper. Probably not the most uh, perfect way to be working, but sometimes it just, you need the color on the paper compared to another color for it to understand, you know, what, what's going on with the composition.
playing some blues in here for the shadows. Okay, so I think I'm at the point now where I want to start uh, using the denatured alcohol in here. Before I do, I want to make sure I'm getting a little bit of surface color down here. So what's important to notice when you're working on a painting where the sun is low in the sky and it's creating long shadows is Although the sun's captured here across the snow, it's not directly hitting it. It's not like it's hitting it straight down. So it's not gonna be bright uh, or as bright as say your highest highlighted area. You might have some edges that get caught there that catch the light. Uh, so that's why I'm kind of throwing down a little bit of a tone here, nothing too dark, uh, but it'll help me set up the whites because I don't wanna have just the white uh, or the cream colored paper showing through. And again, I'll be able to make refinements as I go through. Just trying to give myself a little bit of a little bit of direction here. You may not notice it where I'm laying the, uh, it's kind of a more of a cream color here on the surface. I just want to get a little bit of color on there because I know it's not going to be white. I don't like working with white. And then for the sky, I'm going to start laying in a, a nice blue in here. Again, I'm going to wash this in, but this is just, Kind of setting up my value structure. I'm allowing the pastel of the, the blue to kind of blend a little bit with some of these colors in the trees, even though they're being masked in. Um, you want to have a situation where you have lost edges and found edges. So allowing the pastel to kind of creep into the other color there will add a little bit of variety and interest into the composition. Also, when you're working in, uh, on the sky, generally speaking, what happens is as you get down to closer to the horizon line, that value lightens up. If you look deep into the sky, if you look up, it becomes much more, much darker in value than down towards the horizon line. So I want to just kind of lay a little bit of that in here as a, uh, a base as well, just to catch a little bit of what it really looks like in nature. Okay, I know it looks kind of rough right now, but we're, we're getting there. We're on, we're on task here. Ryan, would this be a good time to come in and take a nice long still shot or not yeah. yet? Yeah, no, that's good. That's fine. You can zoom in. And as you see here, again, I'm not covering the entire surface. I'm not pushing that pastel deep into the paper. It's still kind of light on there. But you can kind of see the elements of the composition coming through now. Um, and I'm not covering the whole surface just yet, but when I lay this uh, denatured alcohol in here, it'll start to cover the surface more. It'll make a little bit more sense. And again, the reason I'm going to lay this denatured alcohol in here is to kind of set this into the surface so that I can build more pastel on top of it. And it's not the alcohol you can drink, so just fair warning. Um, okay, so as I start using this in here, laying in the uh, denatured alcohol, I'm going to start with my lighter areas. Again, I don't really, I'm not worried about details right now, but I'm laying it on the lighter areas first because I don't want that other color to, um, to dirty this too much. So I always start with the, uh, the lighter side as well. 
Again, I'm just kind of brushing it in here really quickly. I don't care if it really flows down. Sometimes actually, as those drips come down, it adds a nice little texture and element to the painting as well. And the reason I use the denatured alcohol again is because it dries really fast. Uh, sometimes I'll use water. Sometimes I won't even use an alcohol wash. I'll just go right with the pastel itself. It's going to look really messy, but that's that's the fun part of it. Again, I'm kind of laying in this little snow bank off on the horizon. Trying to keep my, pr my brush somewhat clean. Another reason I use this is because I don't like looking at white paper. <laughs> I like to add a little bit of value and a little bit of tone to it. When I get to these uh, large shapes in the trees here, sometimes I'll allow the brush to just get a little dry and just come in a little bit into the other color as well, just so I have a softer edge to it. Um, I can dry off the brush and just flick it in here a little bit, just so I, I get a little bit of interaction because I really want areas uh, of blue, in some cases, to pop through where the trees are. And that'll make sense a little bit later in the painting. Now I'm just kind of blocking in this little horizon line of trees in the back. It's difficult to do some of these demonstrations when you're used to doing it with a room full of people and <laughs> questions come flying and uh, it just makes it a little bit more natural to interact. These, uh, these Zoom calls are, are interesting, but it also, I think there's some really positives about it in that you can have more people come to a meeting. You don't have to worry about the weather necessarily, right? Would you uh, be open to a couple questions now while you're working, Brian? Sure. Okay, uh, the first question is, are these oil or soft pastels? Uh, good question, these are soft pastels. Okay, and someone is wondering, uh, is there, back when you were uh, blocking things in, is there a lot of dust falling from the piece and do you have anything to catch it? Um, good question. I don't have too much dust falling from the piece. Generally, the dust gets caught in the bottom of the easel. I usually push, push my board back a little bit. There's usually about a half inch to an inch lip that catches the dust. And then um, when I am doing cleanup, is when I will take a, uh, a wider brush and I just kind of brush that off into a garbage can. I know some people use the, uh, there's like a, a vacuum system that is made that can catch that dust and keep it out of the air. But for the most part, I think the paper does a good job of, of catching most of the pastel itself. And how often do you change the alcohol? Um, not that often. If it gets really dirty, then yes, I will. I will switch it out. Or sometimes I'll filter it into a uh, another glass uh, after it, after the it, the sediment settles in the bottom, and then I can uh, keep it a little bit fresher that way. Again, like I was saying, this stuff dries pretty fast. Everything I put down is already completely dry. I know you probably can't see that on your end, but trust me, it is. Do you have the mat clamped over uh, the piece? And if so, why? Oh, so uh, I have, great question. I basically just put some black paper tape on, on top of the uh, UART board. I really did that 
specifically just so I can kind of identify and, and um, frame out the image itself, more so, more so for the demonstration. I typically don't do that at home. Um, I'll usually just have kind of oops, pencil lines around the edge of it. But again, just for the demonstration, I wanted to make sure that people can kind of see what's going on with the image. Okay, so um, I have kind of the basic shapes going on here. Now I'm gonna to start to kind of dive in with the pastel a little bit, a little bit more here. More here, have, more here, here. A oh, little bit of an echo. Oh. Um, um, is it echoing in your end too or no? No, it's okay. It is? Okay, I'm hearing my, my own voice echo on, in this side, which is kind of, kind of strange. All right. Now I'm going to start uh, again blocking in more color. And these these trees in the background are interesting because there's there's a variety of colors happening in the background. There's some some pine trees back there, so there is a little bit of green, um, but there's also some warm colors in there. And again, if I keep it in the in the same value, I think it'll still work. So I'm not going to have uh, too much variety in there other than a shift in color to add interest to that value. And the way my palette is set up, I, I have it set up kind of uh, light to dark in different sections. So I have like a blue section, uh, a green section, a purple section, and, and what have you. And I start light to dark so I can easily select and pick uh, the pastel color I want to use for that particular area. Again, I'm still kind of keeping a loose hand here. And I want to make sure that I'm moving around uh, the composition pretty well. I have a tendency to want to get into the details very quickly. Uh, and I fight with that throughout every painting uh, or throughout my career, I should say. Uh, but I'm getting a little bit better at it. I used to be way too tight and now I, I think I'm um, a little more familiar and comfortable working with it and knowing how uh, I should be laying the pastel down. Brian, a couple of people have asked to see the palette. Let me know when it would be a oh, good time to switch. Uh, that. This would be uh, perfect. Yeah. You have the photo of that, right? Yes. Perfect. Let me know when you have that up. It's up. It's up? It is. Okay. So you can see the different sections. Now on the far left of it are kind of more of my um, earth tones and a little bit more neutrals. But in that second section is, again, more the blues and then the yellow greens and then the, the purples and then the warmer um, colors on the, uh, on the right side of the palette. And I like working light to dark again. So it makes it easy for me to move from a, uh, a value, say, in a warmer color all the way down to a cooler color, but in the same value range. So sometimes you want that harmony to happen between two different uh, pastel colors. Okay, I'm gonna turn off the screen share and you're back then. Hi everybody. start establishing some of these long reads back here. And I usually work dark to light. Uh, so I'm, again, using a light touch, I'm trying to give a variety of marks in here. Not too concerned about the detail just yet. Now I'm laying in a little bit more of the darks. I know some of my darkest darks are gonna be in this tree, but I wanna make sure I place them in the right area so it's not gonna to be too distracting.
And if you notice again in the background, I don't have a heck of a lot of contrast going on in there and that's okay. I don't wanna play that up right now because first of all, it's, I wanna push that space back. I wanna allow that to kind of just sit there and interact. And, and eventually when I start pumping in more of the lights and the shadows in the foreground, your interest is gonna kind of fall in there. Here, I'm just kind of, I'm picking out a couple areas. Uh, again, a little bit randomly playing between these massive trees in the background and the sky holes kind of peeking through. Again, light, a light touch here. I wanna, I don't wanna have a really sharp edge from where the skyline meets the trees back here. Uh, Cause I don't want your eye to be drawn to that. I wanna have that feeling of it going back into distance. Kind of redefining some of these shapes of the trees in here. And again, the painting's not going to be all about the trees, but I want to kind of establish some of these in the background first. Trying to keep a variety of uh, quality of lines too. You may have some areas that disappear and then come back again. Variety, uh, using a variety of pressure as I work through this as well. All right. really bright blue through there. <laughs> Again, I'm not worried about all the detail in there, but I just want to make sure I'm kind of capturing where these shadow lines are, where I want them to be. And if I don't like an area, a particular area, maybe you lay some marks down and you don't really like where they're at, you can always come in with a, uh, with a brush and just you know take out some of that area, like wipe the pastel off the surface a little bit. It might still be stained in there, um, but you're removing it and exposing the tooth again. So in this case where I kind of rub this down, now I can come back in here and apply a, uh, a lighter, warmer color in here to kind of redefine that edge of that, of that shadow of that tree branch. And again, I'm not going to reach for a white white when I go through uh, the foreground because you're not going to, that's not where the sun is going to be hitting. The sun is hitting lower in the sky and it's not going to create a real light image in the front. Kind of laying in some of the shadows now in the foreground.
again, it's good to occasionally step back and see if the composition's working, see if there's any major, major flaw areas that need to be addressed. Again, as far as uh, brands go, I'm not reaching for any particular brand. I'm just reaching for the color right now. Again, I look, I, I see down in this lower right-hand quadrant, this is really nice uh, soft shadow creeping across the foreground. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna lay in a nice soft value purple to kind of get a, a feel for that. And I'll come over with some lighter colors later, but I'm just trying to establish that as part of the composition. It's all about those little subtle transitions. When you think about it, when, you, when you're outside in nature and you're looking at snow, uh, you can just sit there and get lost in, in the variety of values that can even happen in, within a scene. I'm also mixing in some uh, a little bit lighter pink, but still fairly neutral at this point. And I'll allow the other pastels as I work through the foreground in here to kind of fill in the gaps there and to kind of blend those together. Establishing a little bit of the background color here. Not as bright as I'm going to be with it, but I want to get some of this established. We're gonna add a little bit more shape and form into the trees in the background here now. Just trying to keep the composition moving. Starting to introduce a little bit more of the uh, kind of yellows and ochres here in these in the reeds. A variety of strokes in there. Okay. Brian, could you let us know when it would be a good time to do another close-up? 
Sure, give me uh, two minutes. Kind of laying some uh, broad strokes in here now, kind of cover that surface. I don't want it to be uh, too detailed. I like the kind of airiness in the foreground. So I want to play that up a little bit more. So I got this beautiful kind of pinky peach color just to start livening up that surface a little bit. And I'll come in with some more yellows as well. Go ahead and zoom in there. Starting to come together a little bit, but uh, ways to go. <laughs> I'm pull back up. Thank you. You can also do a lot of variety in the shadows. That's what's really nice too about pastels. Um, and when you think about shadows too, it's not all one color that sits in there. You can have some uh, you know, turquoise blues. You can have some that lean a little bit towards purple. It just adds uh, variety to the composition and adds interest for your eye to be able to move around. And obviously I'm not gonna get as detailed as I would in, a, uh, in one of my finished paintings that I do in the studio, but I wanna make sure I'm trying to cover enough surface here and give you guys a good idea of you know, what's going on in the composition here. And back over here, I do have a really strong light I wanna kind of play up. That's one of the things that, that caught my eye uh, you can see I'm just kind of pushing in some light values in here. I'm not getting detail with it yet, but I'm just trying to form some shapes. And again, you have some kind of soft blending that goes on in some of these uh, tree trunks. And if you think about it, if you study shadows in nature, especially from trees, the shadows that are closest to the image and closest to the sun will naturally cast a sharper edge closer to the object. The more that that shadow travels through space and the more you have shadows of trees that are further off in the distance, that's where you start to get a little bit more of the softer shadows happening. You don't have as hard or rigid of edges. So I've been trying to pay attention to that more as I work through my various compositions, not just this painting, but just in general as an artist, as I grow, I'm trying to, uh, to key into those elements as well, because I think it provides you with a, uh, a stronger feeling composition, if that's what you're going for in terms of um, making it a little bit more realistic. You're trying to capture the feel of it. And with these new pastels, the nice thing about it is you can blend over another color with, with just a light amount of pressure to add some of that variety to it. And I'm not, again, I'm not trying to emulate everything I see in that photo, but I'm trying to get a, uh, an impression of what that scene is to me. And I could, you know, I could spend most of my time if I wanted to right now to jump in and, and work all this out, but I'm, I'm just trying to be cognizant of time and I'm trying to move around the composition as much as possible. I'm trying to soften this edge a little bit here on this tree trunk. All right.
trying to define a little bit more of these uh, trees back here. I wanted to show, have some suggestions of some of the, uh, the tree limbs. I don't want your eye to be drawn to it. I moved to a, uh, a pastel pencil just to give a couple tree branch elements in here. And again, real light variety of surface uh, pressure being applied. And I'm also trying to use a, a variety of uh, colors in here as well, just to add interest. I don't want my eye to be drawn to it or the viewer's eye. I want to play up um, these reeds over here that are really catching that sunlight. Um, and if you, if you could swivel over here to my value study, my small sketch, um, you can see I, they're not just from the photograph, these are showing up as just kind of a, a whitish yellow, but I want to play up a little bit more color, a little bit more interest into it. So I'm going to put a little bit more uh, red and orange into this area just to kind of spark that interest. Again, real light touch, uh, broad strokes. I'm not, I'm not trying to paint every reed of grass that's popping up through here, but just to try to give a, a sense of what that light is doing. Your eye will naturally go there when you have uh, cooler colors around it. I'm playing back in the space over here. I'm adding a, a few of the purples in here as well to kind of push that back. Uh, an important component to making some of those warmer colors pop is using kind of cooler colors, but also neutral colors around it. Uh, sometimes that has a tendency to uh, elevate the, the value of those lighter colors. As I push back through the, uh, the foreground here, I want to establish more of these reeds and, and define these shapes a little bit differently now, uh, or should say separate them out a little bit more. Trying to keep with variety, moving around the composition. Uh, let's see, let me work on these the tree trunk over here on the right. I want to start um, establishing a little bit more of the form in this one. So to do that, I'm going to start adding 
uh, some warmer colors in here, a little bit more intense on the right side. Still keeping it loose though. Too bright. Real light touch to uh, establishing these forms. And then sometimes you need to kind of go back in and redefine edges as well. I'm gonna work on that a little bit. Again, the, the sun is coming strongly from the right side. So I wanna, uh, establish a little bit of a sharper edge here again, because I also want this to be um, kind of a strong grounding section of the painting. I also like to use the side of my finger from time to time just to kind of soften an edge. That's a good way to do it. I find myself also having to, to clean my fingers a fair amount, so I use uh, you know, a little moisturizer, wet naps, and then uh, paper towel to kind of clean up the edges of my hands again, fingers to keep them clean. So I want to get this tree back in here. I feel like I'm, I need to reshape this tree, give it a little bit more volume. So I'm, you see, I'm trying to define it. I'm using, um, in this case, a, a variety of you know, purples and uh, earth tones in here, but then I wanna come back in and start letting the background define that shape. So when I say that, I mean, I wanna start pulling in um, some lighter blues. Again, since it's closer to the horizon, I'm gonna start, uh, with the lighter ones towards the surface. So I can now start blocking in those shapes, those negative shapes between. I'm gonna throw a couple branches in here. I'm not seeing a ton, but you can make it up as, a, as an artist. That's part of the artistic license, right? It's important to get that value right first before you have to really focus on the color. And I can use the edge of the, uh, the blue pastel stick to kind of also redefine the edge of the, of the tree. It's not just about the tree itself, it's about the negative shapes around it. Sometimes I'll allow that color to come through. Let it, again, let lost edges, found edges is an important part of capturing the, the landscape, making it look kind of realistic. Real light pressure around here. I want to kind of mask this in again a little bit more.
good to step back from the painting. Occasionally, I'll even uh, break out a mirror and look at it in reverse to see if there's any areas that are really popping out at me that need to be redefined or changed. I find that a good way to go about it. Also, uh, when you're searching for and want to poke little sky holes through parts of the tree, um, you can't do that too much. You got to be careful about how you do that and where you do uh, place those elements. Because in this case, if I lay this really kind of bright blue in there, your eyes going to be your eyes going to be drawn to it. So sometimes it's just a process of laying that color down to to see that. I might say, okay, that's too bright. So I'll come in with a little bit of a paper towel, tone it back a little bit, and then I might take a uh, a blue that's a little bit deeper, you know, and and lay that in there instead, because then you start having a little bit more of the interaction between the sky and the tree, and it becomes a little bit more believable. If you just bring in that bright color all the time, it's going to look kind of forced. I want to mix this up a little bit. I'm going to have some uh, have a more of a blue green in some areas too, just to add a little more interest. Add a little bit of life to the painting there. Barry, are any more uh, any more questions come through recently, or how are we doing with that? Uh, yes, there are a couple questions. Which brand of pastel pencil do you recommend? Um, you know, I've had a set of the uh, Carbothellos since college. Um, those are the only ones I've ever used. And I don't use them all the time, but in certain areas. And they've, they've lasted me a long time. There's a couple I have kind of uh, sharpened down to the nub, if you will. Like that's still from college. It's it's more than twenty, man, maybe thirty years ago now. Um, so I, I like those a lot. Sometimes some of them can break a little bit more, but those have held up for me through time. Do you use a certain number of colors, uh, say a certain number of blues or yellows, or is but, it more important that you use uh, like more cold colors or warm colors? Um, I guess it depends on uh, what you want to convey, right? The theme of the composition, you know, some paintings are more about color, some are more about value. Um, I don't cognizantly think about that or try to be limiting to myself. Uh, when I'm working in a demonstration, I do try to limit a little bit in terms of the amount of colors I'm grabbing for just from a uh, sake of time perspective. So I might have a little bit more of a limited palette in those cases. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. Uh, you also mentioned the sharper edge of a shadow closer to the object casting the shadow. What about temperature or saturation of color in shadow the further away from an object? Yeah, um, so again, that's up to the artist as well, but generally speaking, yes. I. I try not to have as high of a of a, a chroma or a color in that shadow when it's further back in space. Um, you can play up with the intensity a little bit more when that shadow is closer to you, um, because then your eye is drawn to that particular area. If you're starting to get all kinds of little details in the background, um, and you want that softness and that uh, feeling of distance, you want to keep those colors a little bit more muted or closer in value back there than in the foreground. Okay, let's just take one more. Do you always do a color value study before you do a painting? Not always. No, not always. Um, sometimes I'll even just work in black and white. Uh, and just to show you too, if you can zoom in over here on the camera or on the computer, I have a value. I, I took the photo originally and just created a black and white um, visual of that, just to kind of give me a better understanding of where those values 
uh, played out. And it's a way to kind of look at the composition and steer you away from being influenced by color. It, it pushes you to understand and see the composition a little bit easier. As long as we're here. Yeah, you want to do a close up? Sure. So a little zoom in on kind of where I'm at in the process now. So I want to start uh, defining a little bit more in the shapes in the foreground. I don't want to spend too much time back here right now. I think I've, I've done a fair amount with that. Um, but I want to start pulling the shadows together. It's still kind of, a, uh, it's not all tied together at this point. So I want to start working on the shadows in the foreground now and the interaction between the shadows and the way the light is coming across. And to do that, again, I'm using a, a light touch, but also I'll be using a variety of cooler colors in those shadows. Also, when I'm working back here in the space, I see that there's, uh, there's some snow kind of peeking through here. I don't want it to be as bright or as obvious as what's happening in the, in the blue snow shadows in the foreground. So I'm just gonna, with a real light touch and kind of a, a variety, I wanna break that space up a little bit between the reeds that are in the foreground and these reeds that are on the other side of there's a little creek bed in here. So I'm just gonna lay a little bit of blue in there and I'm going to come back and redefine those reeds as well. A light touch, but I want that heart of a transition in some of these reeds as it goes back into the space. It's a nice variety of marks. This is where you can come in with uh, some of the new pastels and, and chisel these out a little bit too, using kind of a, a flat edge here, the end of it. Again, not trying to draw every little read in there, but just giving some suggestions of it. And I'm coming in, just giving a little more light to some of these areas, kind of picking and choosing where the light is coming through the trees. And I want this solid line of bright white to be, or bright value to be popping through, but picking and choosing it. Okay. Now I'm going to work in the foreground a little bit again to kind of redefine some of these shadows here, start working on a little bit of the transition areas between light and shadow, uh, using kind of broad strokes here, a variety of strokes. Using the edge of my finger to blend a little bit. You can also use a brush, whatever's at your disposal.
and begin again because it's a uh, this foreground is kind of a, a quieter area. I realize I want to kind of reduce the amount of values that I have going on in here. And sometimes you have to kind of lay down a color to really see, is this really where you want it to be? It may not be there until you see it against the other colors on the, uh, on the surface. I think I want to go a little, a little less pink there. And there's some shadows going on in here. I'm just kind of scumbling across the surface a little bit. And also by adding a variety of warm and cool colors, but within a very narrow value range, it will add more interest naturally through that process. Coming in with a uh, sort of like a yellow ochre here, and I'm just trying to come across the surface a little bit just to try to solidify things. Adding a little more light through here now, letting the pinks that I applied earlier still show through. Oftentimes when I'm working in pastels too, if I find I'm reaching for a particular uh, color, often I will tip it up in my palette so I know I can go back to it so it like stands out to me. I feel like it's a little too intense back in here in some of the shadows, so I want to it down a little, but I don't want to go as intense of a blue. So I'm going to, I have a uh, Terry Ludwig value set that are a little bit more monochromatic. So I'm reaching to a, uh, a cooler gray, grayish blue in this area. And I'm going to lay that down a little bit broader. And I might even want to take parts of it cool it off a little or uh, I should say warm it up in some of these areas that were a little too intense for me. And you think of, as I'm working through these areas, I think about these shadows and, and imagine what tree branches they're coming from that are further away. Make sure I'm getting the value right in some of these shadows. I feel like the blue here was getting a little bit, it's fighting a little bit with the uh, with the reeds, which is fine for now, but I'm aware of it. So now I want to address that part of the painting. And I'm going to do that by laying a, a cooler blue in here, but it's a little bit lighter in value. You know, again, real light across the surface and allow some of those other colors to come through, but I'm just trying to make it stand out a little bit more.
As the snow kind of captures the edges of the reeds here, I'm noticing it comes up a little bit lighter in value. I think that's because they're catching a little bit more of the sun in there. It's got a little bit of edge, it's going up in space a little bit. So I'm trying to define that a little bit more. Coming back and just defining this kind of white snow space in the background. Some of these areas I want to leave alone. Like there's there's a nice kind of lost edge here, and I don't want to define the whole thing. So I'm going to try to leave that particular spot alone. And I don't want to be too sharp on my edge back here too. Again, it is further in space, so you don't want that to, to pop out too much. What I am noticing is there's, a, there's spots in here where there's some nice uh, snow and shadow behind the root reeds. And I want to kind of play those areas up too. So real lightly, I'm kind of laying some uh, cooler blues in here to show that snow that's in shadow across that creek bed. Looks like all my blues are very intense tonight. <laughs> Using the side of my finger to kind of soften it a little bit. There's nothing wrong with they having some softened edges in there. I have a tendency to probably be too hard at times. So I'm just going to kind of let that happen. Use the edge of my finger, soften that edge, make it flow a little more naturally through there. Still continuing to move through the composition here. I'm kind of going back up and adding a little more of a softer edge here. I feel like it's too too bright there. And again, there's there's trees here that are also casting shadows in the background. So I want to kind of capture some of those shadows in a suggestive way. I don't want to insult the viewer and give them every bit of information. I want to have them kind of finish some of that composition themselves. Also just trying to uh, solidify some of these shadows. Real soft touch, soft edges. So I laid a, a new pastel blue in there, but I wanna come back 
with a similar value to add interest and to calm that down a little bit because it's just so blue. So I'm gonna add a little bit of purple in here. Again, similar value, variety of, uh, of marks in here, tone it down. Sometimes you can go back in with a, uh, a more neutral color. There's like a, a warmer purple in here. I'm, I'm not afraid to uh, introduce that into here too. Barry, any more questions pop up? Someone asked, are shadows in snow usually cool or does it vary? Uh, it, it varies, it depends on what's going on in the sky. Um, you know, it's cloudy. Obviously there's the theory oftentimes people look at, you know, warm light, cool shadows. And I definitely believe in that. Um, when you have a little bit more of an overcast sky, it's a little bit hard to define that. But generally, shadows are, are cooler in nature. Also, shadows can be influenced by what's happening around them. So, for instance, if uh, on this tree trunk on the right, if it's warmer, there's a lot of warm light hitting that bark. Some of that light is reflecting down onto the snow that's in shadow below it. So you could, in theory, warm that snow up to make it more realistic and feel that light reflecting off of that tree. That definitely happens. How do you go about correcting a mistake without leaving a mark on the paper? Do you wipe it away or is there another method? Um, you can do a variety of things. That's the great thing about art, right? There's no one answer to get to the solution. Um, I can, I will use and have from time to time, I'll use a, uh, a stiffer brush. If I felt like I built up that pastel too much on the surface and it's getting really muddy, then I'll, I'll take the, uh, the side of a, of a brush and brush that off a little bit and then come back in with a lighter touch on a different value of pastel to fix it. You could take a kneaded eraser in there. Um, you could take a paper towel and, and remove some of the surface that way. Again, that's the beauty of pastel and working on these sanded surfaces. There's a lot of forgiveness to them. How do you work uh, on the upper level of the painting without smearing the foreground? Um, my hand is off the surface. It's, it's always off the surface. So I'm not dragging it along the edge of it. It's also, my painting is pitched in a way that it's almost completely vertical. Uh, there is a little bit of dust that drops off, but generally speaking, it doesn't resettle on another area below. It just kind of drops down the, uh, the surface to the tray below. So I don't have issues with that too often. I suppose it could be an issue if you're resting your hand on the surface, if you're working horizontally instead of vertically, then I could see where your hand would, would drag across the surface like that. So now what I'm doing is, I've had this kind of established area that's all in shadow here. And now what I'm doing is very gently with a lighter kind of a peach color, I'm starting to define a little more of the areas where the light is poking through these shadows from the branches of the tree. So um, in essence, I'm shaping those shadows to make it more realistic so that the viewer can see Oh, those are shadows from tree branches because right now it's kind of a little bit, a little bit muddy. Um, and again, I'm doing it by a light-handed touch to the surface. I'm not creating sharp edges because, again, these shadows back here from the trees I'm looking at are from tree branches that are much further away. So naturally, you're not going to have a really hard edge shadow, and there's not going to be broad spaces, uh, broad shadows in here either because. Um, it's not a, a large volume of area that I'm covering. Those are more towards the tree trunk and the, uh, it's closer to the viewer, closer to the sun. So I'm just trying to break that up a little bit.
And as I push harder, again, the same pastel that I'm doing a really light touch to here, I can push it now here and define the light source. So now all of a sudden this light is catching this edge. Um, again, the same color is here, but it doesn't look as, uh, as bright back here because I'm scumbling over the surface and allowing some of that neutral gray to still come through. So again, a variety of pressure can make a big difference in how you apply uh, the pastel to the surface and how realistic that is. Always be thinking about the light source and what you're trying to accomplish with it. And I can come in here, I have this beautiful, really bright uh, yellow. It's a, uh, it's not a new pastel, it's a blue earth pastel, um, bright edge. So if for instance, I wanted to capture a little piece of snow that happened to be drifting up, now, if you, you see that I'm defining that edge, that's gonna be my brightest area, uh, only because the sun is capturing it at that edge. So that's what's realistically gonna capture um, the feel of how that sun is drifting across that snowbank. I, I will do it in uh, limited areas because I don't want it to be too bright and too overwhelming. But again, like I did back here, I can use a light amount of pressure and not necessarily have it pop way up to the surface. So I'm imagining now the sun is, is capturing this edge. I don't want it to be too close to the edge of the painting. It'll drift off, but you can see I'm starting to apply that brighter edge and I'm using a variety of pressure and locations for it to capture the feeling of where that sun is hitting on this like little bit of a snow drift that's moving up. And you can do that in a variety of areas, or it could be in, in this case, there were either footprints or from a person or a dog footprints, and you could actually like capture the edge of those footprints, right? Like, oh, they're walking through that space. So now you're just capturing that edge. Now, when you do that, you wanna make sure you're capturing the shadow side of that too. So on the other side, I'm doing a little bit darker of a purple in there to capture that, give a little bit of a depth to that space. So now suddenly with just a couple of marks, it looks like, oh, there's, there's some animal or something that's been walking through that space. And if that's not what it's about for you, you come in with a paper towel, or a brush or another pastel and you bring it back down. That's not what this painting is about for me. So I'm gonna reduce those. Sometimes I'll blow off the painting a little bit, um, tap it off, burp the baby they say from behind just to try to clear off some of that extra pastel dust on the surface. Step back and realize, all right, I need to start unifying this a little bit more. So I've decided I'm gonna come in here with a uh, very light and value purplish pink color. And I wanna use this to kind of solidify a lot of the foreground. I'm gonna bring it together. I want it to be flattened out a little bit. To me, it was still, still a little busy. Um, so that's what I'm gonna work on now. Again, I'm allowing some of those other colors to still show through because I want that variety and I, want, I don't want it to be too flat. But I do like that calmness that's been in the foreground through this painting. Taking my finger and just knocking it back a little bit because I want this area in the, in the lower right corner to be, to be a little quieter. I don't want your eye to be drawn to that area. And there's lots of stuff going on in the shadows over here, but I wanna to try to simplify it a little bit because I, again, I don't want your eye to be drawn right to that particular um, section. <clears throat> And 
And as the snow flows across the surface, it has a little bit of a dip and a wave to it. So I'm, I'm trying to capture that as well. Sometimes it's broader strokes that do that. Sometimes it's a little bit more detailed. Constantly coming back, stepping away from the painting, checking back in. I want to soften this edge a little bit here. So I'm going real light. Again, I could take my finger and use that to soften that edge. Got to do what works for you. And coming back in and uh, adding some shadows that feel like need to be in there to kind of tell the story a little bit better. So even though generally speaking, I work light to dark, there's nothing to say you can't come back in and lighten an area or darken an area later. Like the shadow back here got to be a little too intense. I want to tone that back a little bit. Start tying a little bit more of the sky together here to this painting, make a little bit more of a transition between the uh, lower part of the sky and the upper. Start defining the edges of these trees a little bit. <clears throat> And just to add interest, I'm looking for a uh, another value that's similar to this blue, but I want to get it in a little bit different color. So I'm going to add a bit of variety of more purple, and then maybe a little bit leaning towards the greener side of that. As well. Again, keeping in mind that as you move up into the sky, the color becomes a little bit more, a little darker, a little richer. So I want to play that up a little bit up here. variety of marks uh, along with variety of color value are what adds more energy and interest to a painting.
just going to carve out a little bit of these trees in the background here. Real soft edge to it, because again, I don't want your eye drawn to that area in particular. For the sake of time, I'm going to try to uh, hop it up a little bit, add some touches that I normally would do a little bit later, but I think it's probably time to do that now. A little more interest, a little more of a brighter orange color in here to mix along the yellow. And we have a little moments of that popping through here with these little areas of sun that's capturing these edges. And I want to do that kind of those little moments, not just in the reeds, but elsewhere to kind of bring things together. I think this tree could be formed a little bit more succinctly there. So I might come in and uh, clean up some edges first. It's a little hard edged here, so I wanna get a little bit there. Imagine this tree branch coming out here a little bit. I'm not using really uh, sharp edges on these trees back here, because again, I don't want my eye to be, or the viewer's eye to be drawn to them. So just creating suggestions of shapes of trees back here. Some nice sunlight hitting this tree, so I want to play that up a little bit. I also want to play, if you look in the shadows here, I want to try to pull a little bit of that sun that's been creeping in in these other areas back in here. I want to have these little moments of, of sunlight popping into the, uh, to the snow area. So real lightly, just suggestions of the sun popping in through those branches. Variety of pressure I'm, I'm laying on the surface. I'm also looking at trying to get some areas to pop a little bit more here. So I might just put in a couple little sharp marks just to add interest, tone this edge here though. See all these, uh, these little marks here towards the end are the ones that kind of start making things really come to life. Ready to kind of make some of these shadows disappear and then come back. Let 
in here, I want to kind of define this. This is definitely a, an area that kind of breaks um, breaks away from the tops of those shadows of the trees. So I'm going to come in there and just block that in since it's further away from the viewer. I can define this more as like one shape. So as I do that, I'm just going to do a couple quick deliberate edges here. Come in here with this, uh, my, my lightest light, if you will. And I'm going to put a couple of moments of light through here where the sun is catching these edges. I can also do that back here. I don't think I want to go quite as bright in the back for the snow. But I do want to define this a little bit more. I don't want to do it all in one big shape, but I want to kind of break it up. Imagine this little snow bank here, catching the light. Kind of off in the distance there. Sometimes it's like those, those little adjustments that can start making things uh, come to light. It's just a matter of trial and error, having a fresh eye to it. Just softening these edges a little bit on some of these areas. And so much of this painting is about these tree shadows. So I'm gonna start playing those up even more. And I'm doing that again by starting to apply a lighter value with a little more pressure, a little bit more of the deliberate marks. Even through here, there's a lot of little nuances, but parts of it I wanted to like really show. This is a strong sunlight coming through. Let it let it sing. And again, some areas I just come across broader strokes, variety of pressure, varying the color. Making a little bit softer on the edges here because I don't want your eye to be drawn right to that edge and pull you off the pit, off the whole plane. So I'm, I'm trying to soften that a little bit. Constant adjustments. I love some of the uh, lighter purples too. I, I have a tendency to lean towards those a little bit more recently in my paintings. I like the uh, transition to more subtle shifts and change in color. How are we doing on time, Barry? 
Looks like we've got about 15 more minutes. Okay. Do you wanna, is there any more questions that have popped up? Just a, a couple. Could you explain the difference between soft pastels and oil pastels? Um, good question. Oil pastels are very different. I haven't used oil pastels that often. Uh, it's been a number of years since I've touched them, but they're, they're oil based. So uh, I think people have a tendency to paint with them a little bit more. Dry pastels, soft pastels are really just pure pigment held together with a, uh, a little bit of, of a binder like gum Arabic, uh, something along those lines. Um, I know you can paint a lot more with the oil pastels, but I, again, I have not really incorporated them into my work over the years. Um, but I know they're very different. <laughs> Obviously, you can use one the the oil paint, or the oil pastels, with more of a turpentine versus water soluble with uh, with pastels. When you're softening or blending, uh, how do you choose, or when do you choose alcohol, or rubbing it with a paper towel, or with your hand? Um, I think, generally speaking, I use the. Uh, denatured alcohol at the beginning stages when I'm just doing that lock in uh, to kind of cover that surface, establish my shapes, my large values, my forms. Um, that's generally the only time I use the denatured alcohol. Um, other than that, I will just use um, pastel to blend it or, or a brush sometimes to, to blend or to even remove uh, color in a, in a particular area. And what about the size of the brushes that you're using? Yeah, um, so I use a variety. I try to generally keep them a little bit broader. This is a, uh, I think a Grumbacher brush. It's about an inch wide. Um, I don't try to use too much of the brushes that often. Uh, and I don't get a lot smaller than an inch wide one because then I'm like, they're starting to noodle it too much. <laughs> Uh, I, I allow the pastel to do most of the work in the painting as much as possible. And then when you get a chance, if you could talk about how you would finish the piece, perhaps with a protective spray, a mat, yeah. reaming, that type of thing. Yep. Um, so I don't use spray. I used to use spray. Um, it has a tendency to dull the color. Do I have it somewhere? It's not this one. Um, it's over there. It's over there. Oh yeah, sorry. Thank you. Um, so there are certain sprays that definitely darken pastels. They flatten them as well. I, I did a little sample here to show you. The, I don't know if you can see it on camera. Hopefully you can. The left side is an area that's been treated with, uh, I think it was Blair Workable Flip Fix. Where is that? The other side has not been treated with it. So as you can see, as I rub my hand down here on this side, the colors are fixed, right? Flat, right? And then over here though, if I move my hand across, it does kind of blend them. Now there is a, uh, a different brand that has popped up over the last several years that some people use as a spray fix um, and it's worked well for them. Um, and of course, I can't think of the brand name right now. I'm trying to look back through my notes. Uh, it's a casein based spray and it doesn't generally darken the color or flatten it. But overall, I just generally don't like to use the sprays. Um, I just like to use the pastel to kind of build up the layers from there. I don't fix it. Um, I usually pat it off from behind before I frame it. Um, I rarely have instances where there's too much pastel it's dropping down. If it does, the way I frame it, I use a, uh, uh, a little spacer, an acrylic spacer that sits between the frame, uh, or between the glass and the painting. And it sits down below into that little notch of the frame. It has a tendency to sit below where you can't see it. If there's any, if there's any dust that does uh, drop off, it stays at the, uh, behind the frame itself. So you don't really see it. But generally, again, if you, tap it off pretty well before you frame it. Uh, and you're using a good surface like a sanded tooth, it's gonna hold uh, the pastel. I'm not saying you can't spray fix, and just be, be wary that you might have to 
you, it may dull your colors if you use it. Any other questions? Someone was asking about the color swatches to the upper left of the painting. Were those reference hues? Yeah. yeah, so these were just some of the colors I was picking out as I was working through my original sketch, um, my value study, my sketch for the larger painting. So I do that occasionally as kind of a reminder of these are some of the go-to colors. These are some colors I feel work well in harmony. Um, and again, I didn't quite get there in this, in this painting and the time frame I have. I will finish this up and hopefully we'll be able to show it to the, to the group at a later time. Um, but that, that point of reference is all that is there to kind of give me an idea of these are kind of the color schemes I wanna work with or the colors I wanna work with. There's so much more I want to do to this, <laughs> and I will. I just need to get a little more time. I, I would generally try to start picking out more of the negative shapes in here and defining these trees a little bit more as well. Any other questions? Someone asks, do you hold a paper towel in your left hand in order to clean the pastel? Um, no, generally I clean my hands with it. <laughs> uh, the pastels usually go back in their trays and like once a month or so, I'll go through and spend some time actually cleaning off pastels one by one. Um, but generally I either have a paper towel or a little um, wet wipe to keep the colors clean on my hands. I didn't do that so much tonight, but uh, that's what I use it for. Occasionally I use the paper towel to you know, wipe us at the surface a little bit. I have a tendency to use a variety of different uh, things between a, uh, a paintbrush and a paper towel to remove a little bit of the pastel when I feel it's building up too much. Mm -hmm. And someone's just reinforcing you, do you work from light to dark? Generally speaking, I work from dark to light. And you, how long do you how long do you take with that uh, first that uh, initial study that you did before you did the larger piece? Um, generally, when I do a study of this size for a larger painting, it could be half hour to forty five minutes, maybe. Uh, I know a lot of people will do them, and sometimes I will do them smaller than this. I, I probably got a little bit detailed here, um, but I wanted to kind of work out some things. I would do more in this finished piece, you know, similar to here with kind of the light poking through uh, the sky, poking through the, uh, the trees. But uh, yeah, generally about a half an hour uh, or less uh, is what I would suggest and what I've seen other artists work in. And someone asks, is it, is it difficult to know when to stop painting in order to prevent overworking the piece? That is the age old question, isn't it? Um, I think there are times in a painting, depending on how things are going in your mood, as well if you feel you're struggling or not, there are times you need to walk away, right? Because I've done it before, maybe every artist has before, where you kill a painting, you overwork it, right? Sometimes I I step away from the studio, I'm thinking that, that painting is done, right? I'm, I'm finished with it. I walk away, I, I come back either an hour or two later or maybe even the next day and I come back in and I say, wow, I got a lot of work I still have to do. Or sometimes I say, that's exactly what I wanted to say. Um, but there are definitely times where I get a little frustrated and have to walk away. Um, and, and, and usually when I walk away, it's, it's a good reason to do it. Um, Stepping back will help you from having to walk away from it because stepping back and looking at it just for a second or two can oftentimes open up your eyes to see areas that you need to either rework or, or fix or enhance. Um, so that's kind of my approach to that. 
a couple of people are recommending uh, sprays that might not dull the color like uh, Lascaux. I'll spell it L-A-S-C-A-U-X. Yep. That's a good one. And someone is asking, uh, this is turning out so beautifully, is winter your favorite season? Uh, it is from a painting perspective. <laughs> uh, winter, you know, I, I do love getting out of nature in winter, especially I'm always excited about that fresh snow that comes down. What I don't like is when it's, you know, like everybody else, right? When it's, you know, five degrees or even below zero and you can't, you know, get outside and actually enjoy it. But I, I do love the season. Um, it's definitely my favorite season to paint, but it's not my favorite season to be out painting in. <laughs> uh, again, I'm primarily a studio painter, but but I do enjoy nature and getting out in it. I just you know will walk outside a lot when it's you know probably 20 or above and, and enjoy it. I love the peacefulness of it. I think that's most of the questions that we have whenever you'd like to, to finish whatever you're doing, and then we can also show the slideshow. Sure, you wanna show that? Oh, you mean later after this? Yes. Yeah. Should we do a close up? Yeah, you wanna do a close up? Sure. So there it is. It's getting there, it's getting closer. Yes, and this program is being recorded. We will uh, allow you some time to finish it up and we can include your final piece as a long still shot at the end of the recording. But let me go ahead and screen share the slideshow that you sent me. Great. And anything you'd like to say about your process or about your work or about your materials while people have a chance to watch this lovely slideshow. Sure. You know, I would just say, as an artist, you have to kind of jump into what grabs you, what defines you, what captures you, and you know, just jump in and, and do the work, right? You got to put in the time to do the work and to, you know, I, I would definitely suggest experiment as much as possible, uh, but find what you love and, and paint it and explore it. Take a subject, paint it over and over and over again until you feel like you've mastered it or you're ready to move on to the next one. Um, you know, there is no right answer for anything in art. There's just uh, the process and the journey. And for me, it's it's an ongoing journey. When I say a journey, it's not just the journey through a particular painting. It's the journey as an artist through life as you're growing and changing and you're absorbing and you're looking at other artists' work and you're getting excited about things. You know, find those things that are going to excite you and, and, you know, jump in wholeheartedly. Someone is asking, do you often work from photographs or do you tend to work plein air? Uh, I don't work in plein air enough. I really should do more of that. Um, I'm more of a studio painter. That's kind of where I've carved my, my niche. Uh, I control the elements a lot more, but I do appreciate plein air. Um, there, there's so much more that goes into that. You know, that is completely about being immersed in the space and feeling all your senses. And it's not about the finished product of the painting. It's about the act. It's the process of painting. I think that's what grabs plein air painters um, and excites them the most. And, you know, to go out and paint with other people that do plein air is exciting because you get, get to not just critique, but you get to share the experience together and see how others paint the same scene. Um, you know, it's exciting. And again, be there in front of the elements and, and, uh, and working through that. That's a whole new level. You know, in, in, the, in the studio, you control the space and, and what you do. But out there, there's sometimes these little idiosyncrasies in nature that, you know, blow your easel over or starts raining on you or whatever, which makes it part of the experience. 
Do you have favorite favorite pastel artists yourself, either past or present? Um, you know, I've certainly liked Degas' work uh, quite a bit, just the Impressionist in general, uh, Cezanne. Um, you know, I like a lot of contemporary artists today. You know, the ones that you see in pastel journal. Uh, you know, I have a tendency to gravitate towards landscape artists, but there's just some absolutely phenomenal painters out there. Um, you know, and I can't, I can't point out one, but I know there's a lot out there, especially in the Chicago Pastel Painters group alone. You know, a lot of great talent out there, great people. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't want to point out one particular painter, but I just like to look at, you know, all pastel artists, especially those that, you know, are working day in and day out doing workshops and you, know, you see their work online and in Pastel Journal Magazine, uh, those that capture light, those are the ones that I kind of gravitate towards. Someone is commenting about the amazing colors in this, in these lovely pieces that, that we're seeing in this slideshow. Are these enhanced from your photographs or is it imagination? Um, the, the colors are punched up definitely um, from, I mean, the photos obviously aren't themselves, but I uh, have a tendency to, you know, capture a scene, absorb it when I'm looking at it. You know, the photos are one thing that I bring back and look at it, right? But I'm absorbing most of that in nature and I'm, and I'm seeing the possibilities of what I can do to convey that in paint. So uh, when, I, when I paint with pastel, I have a tendency to, you know, bounce that color up a little bit higher or, you know, change it to a slightly different color just to make, uh, more variety and interest to it. Just thank you very much to this uh, to Page Art League, as well as uh, Wheaton Public Library for having me here this evening, uh, and for you know coming out for those that are here, uh, grueling the elements. Uh, again, I really appreciate it. I love the interaction. I wish you all could be here live, um, but I know that's not the case, and everybody pushes through that. So again, I appreciate you showing up on Zoom this evening and, and watching and uh, hopefully learning a little bit. Absolutely. Well, again, there's, there's a lot of gratitude coming through in the chat to you, Brian. Thank you so much. I know that it takes quite a bit of time and effort to put these programs together uh, and have all of the materials and, and all of the parts working together. So thank you so much to that for that. And our gratitude, of course, to the DuPage Art League for all that they do to put these programs together for us. So with that, we will say good night. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Uh, stay, take care and stay safe in the snow tonight. Good night. <laughs>